Will you pray with me? Holy God, we pray that you would speak your words to us this morning. May the words of my mouth and the meditations on all of our hearts be acceptable unto you. For you, O Lord, are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So here we are in the second week of Advent. Uh, let me get a show of hands. How many of you have your trees up and decorated? About half. That's, mine is not even anywhere close. The decorations are still in the basement. Um, we've been a little busy. <coughs> How many of you um, already have some of your presents purchased? Wow, that's more than trees decorated. Y'all are good. Dwight and I went out to go Christmas shopping this week and bought one present. So we're doing pretty good. How many of you have your trees wrapped and under the tree? I mean, your presents wrapped and under the tree already? Good. That made me feel a lot better. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, our schedules are getting pretty full with school concerts and work parties, and yet it's only December 6th. You know, we refer to this time of year as the holiday season because I think it's a bit like running a marathon, right? It's exhausting. And added into that is the dynamic that all over we hear messages of this being the most wonderful time of the year, time to spend with family and friends, a time of joy and peace, and yet, for many of us, it doesn't feel like the most wonderful time of the year. And being with family and friends is sometimes far from joyful. It is hard and exhausting. Or maybe we don't have friends and family to be with. And so it's hard to feel the joy and peace when you're taking relatives to the hospital, spending a holiday without someone for the first time, sitting by the bedside of a friend who's dying, or like we did this week, watching news after news of shooting after shooting. Where is the joy in that? This Advent, we're talking about this dichotomy in our faith, living in a world where it is hard to feel joy during a church season when we're told to be joyful. Each week, we're going to be walking through the four Gospels, through each one of the four Gospels, trying to see what lessons we can learn from how each author tells the story of Jesus' birth a little uniquely. Last week, we began with the Gospel of Mark, and we learned that he begins not with the story of Jesus' birth, but with Jesus and his cousin John the Baptist already grown and beginning their ministries. Matthew, however, seems to start in a much more logical fashion. He begins with a genealogy. Now, there's a few things you need to know about the Gospel of Matthew before we begin. Matthew is either the second or third Gospel written. His timing is very close to the writing of the Gospel of Luke. And if you remember, I told you last week that Matthew and Luke use Mark as a source because Mark was the first Gospel written. 90% of what's in Mark, sometimes word for word, is also in the Gospel of Matthew and in the Gospel of Luke. However, Matthew does have a few unique characteristics that are slightly different from the other Gospels. First, we are sure that Matthew is very clearly written for a Jewish audience. Matthew is writing because he wants the Jewish folks he's writing to to know very clearly that Jesus is a fulfillment of prophecy. Jesus brings completion to God's plan for the Israelites' redemption and through them the redemption of the world. We see that right from the very beginning in his genealogy. Numbers had important meaning in the ancient world and especially in the mindset of ancient Jews. And one of the most important numbers um, that they used was the number seven. So right in the beginning of scripture, in the story of creation, in the beginning of Genesis, it tells us that the world was created in... Thank you, just checking to make sure you're still awake. And the seventh day was the... Sabbath, the day of rest and wholeness and healing. So seven stands for completion, for wholeness, for healing. Every time the number seven occurs in the Bible, it has a connotation of completeness and by extension of restoration and healing. So for instance, in the passage that Dwight read from Matthew, um, no, he, you read 28, didn't you? The sheep and the goats. In Matthew 18, when Jesus is asked, how many times should I forgive someone who sins against me? Should I forgive as many as seven times? Jesus answers, no, not just seven times, but rather as many as 77 times. So in his reply, Jesus is not just choosing a random big number to tell Peter that he has to forgive a lot. He is saying that forgiveness is participating in God's desire to reconcile creation back to its original 
created order. Forgiveness brings ultimate healing, ultimate reconciliation and restoration between you and that person and between you and God. So if we go back to the genealogy, we see that Matthew begins his gospel by telling us that Jesus came into the world following three sets of generations. If you're really good at math, that means 42 total generations from Abraham to Jesus. Now again, go back to elementary school, 42 is 6 times 7, so that's six sets of seven generations, which means that when Jesus was born, he ushered in the seventh set of seven generations. What Matthew is saying is that he is the ultimate completer of completion, the great restorer of restoration. Matthew is saying that Jesus' arrival is the greatest and final work of God to heal and bring wholeness to this broken and bruised and conflicted world. I love Matthew's genealogy because of the people he chooses to mention. He puts in characters that are unlikely and reminds us in doing so that God often chooses the unlikely people to participate in his work. He mentions Rahab the prostitute who saved the spies before Joshua invaded Canaan, and she is part of Jesus' ancestry. David is mentioned, who is, of course, the great king, but also an adulterer and a murderer. Rehoboam is mentioned, who was not a very good king, and who ultimately led to the division of the Israelite kingdom. Ruth is mentioned, who we learned just a few weeks ago was something of a scandal, but also incredibly loving and brave and loyal. What I love is that Matthew doesn't hide any of the skeletons in Jesus' closet, because he wants to remind his readers that even Jesus' ancestors are evidence of how sinful and broken the world has become, but also evidence that God chooses to use them anyway to bring about the birth of the Messiah. And he wants us to know that not only has God come to be with us, but that God has come at just the right time. So after the genealogy, we begin the story of Jesus' birth. And in Matthew, we begin not with Mary, but with Joseph. Matthew tells us that Joseph was a righteous man. And when he uses those words, Matthew wants us to think of Noah and Job and others like them, men who did and said the right thing, but who suffered anyway. Then notice the angel's message. The angel doesn't come to him and say, cheer up, Joseph, it's the first Christmas. He doesn't say, hey, this is the most wonderful news of the year. No, he starts with simple and powerful words, do not be afraid. It is in real terms recognition that fear is the appropriate response to the news that Joseph had been given. But it's also a call to resisting that response, a call to refuse to let the trauma of his external circumstances consume him with fear and disillusionment. And then after the acknowledgement of that fear, the angel shares a promise. You will have a son and you will call him Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. Joseph isn't given any proof, right? There's nothing to show him. He's given promise and he's given a choice. He can take the angel at his word and do the extraordinary thing that he's being asked to do, or he can make the choice that many others would and do what is expedient. He can save Mary and put his own reputation on the line, or he can save his own hide and send Mary away. Matthew, I think, wants us to sit for a moment with the complexity of that choice that Joseph has to make because he presents us in his gospel with the same kind of choice over and over. It's a similar choice that the Magi will make in just a short while later in chapter 2, and it's kind of Matthew's theme for all of us. He's saying to us, as followers of Christ, we have to make the choice to follow him, even when it is costly to do so. Daily, we must make the hard and extraordinary choices. So Matthew gives us Joseph, the portrait of a righteous man making the hard and good choice. But Matthew also gives us Herod. Now, if we were doing one of those plays where you make noises when you hear a word, when we heard the word Herod, we would all boo. So let's try it. God gives us Joseph and God gives us Herod. That was pretty enthusiastic, actually, right? Herod is the villain to complete the story. Joseph is the righteous man, the one we should be like. Herod is the one that we... Good job. Excellent. 
Now, if Matthew used his description of Joseph as a righteous man to help us call to mind Noah and Joseph, his description of Herod, you guys are good, is certainly supposed to call to mind parallels of the Old Testament's main villain, Pharaoh. That would also deserve a boo, I think. Both of them, our tyrannical rulers, were just a little bit paranoid. Both viewed the Israelites as a threat to his people and his power. Both ordered the massacre of innocent children in order to eradicate the threat that one would be born who would become a ruler and take over. Both Moses and Jesus are taken to safety. Now, Matthew doesn't paint Herod in the most positive light, but history doesn't do so either. We know from history that as Herod's power grew and grew, you guys are really good. All right, we can stop now. I don't know how many more times I say it, but we're good. So as his power grew and grew, he came to see even his own sons as a threat. He eventually executes three of his sons in addition to his grandfather-in-law and one of his wives. Herod had such a bad reputation that there was a saying, it's better to be Herod's pig than his son. Now the joke, of course, was being that as a Jew, Herod wouldn't eat pork, so pigs were safe around him. But his own children were certainly not safe. Now even though Herod was a Jew, he shows through his actions over and over again that his loyalties were primarily to Rome, but even more so to himself. So these are the characters that Matthew chooses to focus on. Not Mary and the shepherds and Zechariah or Elizabeth, but Joseph and Herod, and then the Magi who will show up in chapter 2. In using Joseph and Herod, Matthew is showing us the choices we have in this world, the two responses that we can make. One out of paranoia and fear, out of our own self-interest and desire like Herod, or we can be like Joseph, a righteous man, choosing hope that was the appropriate place to do that. Man, you guys are on. <laughs> choosing, <laughs> choosing hope and joy in the midst of trauma and chaos. What I like about the Gospel of Matthew is that his story of Jesus' birth is not an overly joyful or simple one. He doesn't ignore the threats going on in the world. Indeed, the picture that he paints is of a world filled with brokenness, with fear, and with misery. He doesn't come to the readers and say, hard, but be happy anyway. He says it is into this broken world, into this chaos, that God comes. He doesn't want us to see the imminent arrival of Jesus as a chance to escape from the miseries of this world, but to face them head on, inviting us to find the presence of Jesus right in the midst of this world right now. We see that message right at the beginning when the angel is talking to Joseph. Here, Matthew quotes from the prophet Isaiah saying, A virgin will become pregnant and will give birth to a son named Emmanuel. God is with us. And that is what Matthew wants us to know. As we all know, our lives are filled with a constant changing between mountaintop experiences of joy and gladness and low valleys filled with pain and turmoil and grief. Even happy events can bring those feelings. It's as if Matthew is saying to us, the only certainty we have is that no matter what place we're in, the high mountaintop experience or the low valley, God is with us. No matter what you are going through, God is in it with you. Maybe your life is a lot like Joseph right now. Maybe you're struggling through some pain or trauma so intense that it's hard to sense anything else through the fog of your disillusionment. But Matthew reminds us there is a redemptive hand already at work because God is there in the midst of uncertainty, in the middle of ambiguities, right smack dab in the mysterious, God is there. Maybe in some ways you are feeling a little bit like Herod right now, with just a smidge of self-protection coloring your choices. Maybe lately you've more often taken the easy choice instead of the hard and good choice. But God tells us, Matthew tells us that God is ready to change even that in our lives. As I told you last week, God has started working on the waiting part that I really don't like in my life even before Advent started as we waited for Cohen to come last week. And this week, I've done a different kind of waiting, as I sat by the bedside of a dear friend who's dying. And in that, I've learned many lessons. 
I've been a pastor for 11 years, so I've done quite a few deathbed vigils. I've prayed with families as they asked for their loved one to go peacefully and without pain. I've helped people walk through the tough decision to not seek any more medical treatment and to simply wait. And that's what my friend has done. My friend Lindy is one of the sweetest people I know. She has a smile that lights up the world and a giggle that is infectious. She loves animals. Her sister calls her the pet whisperer and has a gentle kind of spirit, one such that you can imagine that she is the one Walt Disney thought of when creating the character of Snow White, right? I can picture Lindy sitting in the yard with birds flocking to help her work and deer just sitting at her feet. She's that kind of gentle person. A few years ago, Lindy was diagnosed with cancer and did a number of treatments. She was allergic to some of the chemo they gave her, so it created more than the normal havoc that chemo creates. And so after about three rounds of it, Lindy made the decision to stop. And for a long time, did really well. The cancer stopped progressing, and Lindy just lived. She threw herself into ministry in her church and her community. She spent time with her sisters. And then about two months ago, the cancer came back. I had been with her and her sister on a weekend ministry retreat and noticed that Lindy seemed just a little bit off. She wasn't giggling as much as she normally did or talking as much as she normally did. And her sister was with us, and so I mentioned to Billy what I'd seen. And at first we thought that maybe she just had a cold, but soon came to find out that the cancer was back with a vengeance because she now had a brain tumor. She lost some of her words, and her giggles started to be used when she didn't know what else to say. This last week, she had a stroke that left her without the use of one arm, and she entered hospice. Her sister, Billy, in conjunction with another friend and I, uh, also a pastor, had planned a party for Lindy. We wanted to gather together all of Lindy's friends and sing her favorite songs and eat her favorite foods, which happens to be chocolate, and remind her of how much we loved her. But after the stroke this week, we weren't sure if that could happen because we didn't know if she'd be strong enough to come. But it did, in her hospital room in Virginia. We gathered with about 20 people last night, and we sang and prayed and ate chocolate and peanut butter. Lindy, who hasn't been able to speak in complete sentences since the end of October, sang along with us as we sang Amazing Grace. The version that we sang, which is the one that our men's choir sang uh, about a month ago, has a chorus that says, My chains are gone, I've been set free. My God, my Savior, has ransomed me. And like a flood, his mercy reigns, amazing love, amazing grace. It's Lindy's favorite song, and she's been saying just parts of the chorus to her sister over the last week. Every once in a while, she'll turn to Billy and say, Billy, my chains are gone. My chains are gone. She is ready. And she is facing the present, the really hard present, with courage and grace. Because she already knows her future, and she knows that God is in it with her, and that God will bring it to completion. That Emmanuel, God with us, is with her at her bedside. My prayer for us this Advent is that we may all know that joy in the midst of waiting, the joy that comes in the midst of hardship as we take our journey through life's up and downs. And like Lindy, may we find strength to look for the joy in the present. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen.